Well, good morning and welcome to College Drive Community Church. Uh, thanks for watching, tuning in online. Today is Sunday, August the 9th, another beautiful sunny day in southern Alberta. And I want to welcome you uh, to worship today with the words of Psalm 108, which says, My heart, O God, is steadfast. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples, for great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day, once again, where we can set our hearts uh, towards you, that we can focus our thoughts and our adoration to you. Thank you that, that your faithfulness reaches to the skies, and we seek to exalt you, to lift your name higher today. Uh, we thank you that you are present with us, and we lift your name in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship our God together. Fade. 
face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Let me walk upon the water 
Well, good morning and welcome to College Drive Church. Uh, great to have you here with us today. My name is Kimball. I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, wow, there was like people behind me over here. I, I didn't, uh, didn't see them. I was like, man, where is everybody? They're all over here. Well, not, not all of you. Uh, good to have each and every one of you here. If you are visiting with us, i uh, really glad that you've chosen to be with us today. Even if you're spying from another church. Uh, this did happen. This was a couple weeks ago. Um, someone I, I met out in the parking lot and said, I don't know you. I've met you before. And said, oh, I'm just spying from another church to see how you're doing it. And I'm like, follow everything that we're doing exactly the way we're doing it. I don't know, spritzing everywhere. Uh, no, but it's, uh, it, it is a reality that in our, our community, you know, we, uh, we realize we are, we're blessed at this time to be able to meet, to gather in this way. Other churches are still struggling and, and learning. Some are, are starting up in the next little while, and some are just saying, you know, we're not, we're not going to for the rest of this year. And so those are things that every church has to navigate. And uh, so, but today we're, we're grateful that we get to be together in this way. And we also say uh, hello to those who are watching online. We're glad that you're chosen, you've chosen to be with us in that way uh, today. 
Um, just want to say, as far as um, an offering, we, uh, we're, we're at a place where we don't even know when we'll be able to do this, to pass an offering basket around anymore. There might come a time where we'll put a basket out. You can still uh, drop your offering if it's in an envelope in the mail slot. That is pried open, so you don't have to even touch anything. Just slip it in there by the, by the office window. Um, but uh, otherwise, the, the best ways are, as you see here, uh, as far as e-transferring, and many of you have shifted to that operation, and uh, also you can do it um, as far as going to our website, and you can do it there through canadahelps.org, and we'll direct you as well. A few family life things, uh, good things. You know, one thing I often tell people, I say, well, I can't read your mind. Uh, I may not see everything on social media. I don't know every uh, thing that's happening in your life, but I do know a few because little birds have told me things. So, uh, let's see, where do I start? Uh, we had some birthdays, some significant ones. It was always birthdays, but I think, I think Russ Tabachnik is 50. Is that right? <laughs> All right, there's a, there's a good one. Um, I, I saw on the, the Friday memo that Janice Algra also has a significant birthday. But she's not here, I don't think, is she? She Was it 60? Oh, she's right there, right behind me. 60, Janice? You look hardly a day over 40. Those are, those are good milestones. Uh, we also had a few grandbabies that were born. Uh, Randy and Janet, this is like your 72nd. Something like that. Um, so again, these are things that I don't know. So I, I heard that you had another grandbaby. Is this number eight? Just because you have a mask on, you, you can speak it out. Just, what did you have? What? Okay, all right. And so boy, girl. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay, awesome. And uh, also Kevin and Penny. Another grandbaby there. What did you? Another boy. Okay, and that's uh, five. That's ah, close. <laughs> I didn't have very good odds of getting that one right. If I did, uh, but congratulations to you. Um, we also uh, recognize we've got a few people here that we've been praying for. We prayed for last week outside. Uh, good to see Amy again, healing up. Uh, broken femur from a quad accident and great to have you here with us and um, also Ryan is right here as well and Ryan had tests done had a mini stroke and but tests went well and seemed to be doing okay and Ryan's here back there so give a wave Ryan nice to have you here um, probably miss other things that are going on in, in your life but that was uh, some things that I, I thought I would share also just an update um, I don't know if Pat is here, but Jerry uh, is in the hospital, and so is being looked after there, and so is responding well to some treatment that he's uh, received there. And, um, oh yes, and also um, Mary Cook, whose mother passed away the week before. Her, her mom's celebration of life is in Kamloops this Wednesday at 11, so just be praying for Mary. And also she, uh, she had her surgery this last week on her thumb, and everything went well. I don't know if Mary's here. But uh, keep Mary in your prayers throughout this week as well. Um, one of the things that we have been involved with throughout this COVID season through this summer is, uh, and some of you have gotten involved in this, is working and volunteering at the soup kitchen here in Lethbridge. And so Scott and Brigitte Sear have pulled this together and developed some teams, and they have been uh, uh, doing this every, pretty well every Friday, I think, except for one Friday a month. And uh, so some of you have been involved with that. And so Ian Martin's put together a little video and that we're going to show you sort of a taste of what happens at the soup kitchen and our, our commitment, our involvement to that. And just one thing, as uh, we transition out of that and Gearhard comes and will lead us in prayer following that, but just want to let you know that as Scott and Brigitte transfer sort of into young adult uh, leadership in the fall, once again, uh, they're looking for someone that would potentially take on this role uh, if it's going to continue on a regular basis at the soup kitchen. And so some involvement in coordinating the team and things like that. So if God would put that on your heart, you might want to be in conversation with uh, Scott and Brigida about that. But uh, check this out. A really important thing to be able to just give back some of the blessings that 
I've been given. It's something that I really enjoy being able to cook and it's serving in a very practical way and I'm like having the practical approach where everyone needs to eat so it's serving those people who maybe would get the same nutritious meal if they didn't um, have the soup kitchen here. Um, I think it's just a general happiness and just a little bit of a joy from knowing that you know giving back and it's also just a broadening perspective so that it's like oh I get to see that there is more people in the community than maybe I just look at in a regular day. It's interacting with people that I wouldn't otherwise. Some of them are desperate for just for one meal that they haven't had for days. And so the soup kitchen is this amazing opportunity for them to be able to just enjoy a meal for free and even have some, some conversations with people in their own uh, table. I'm actually doing something for the community and that if I can help them in any sort of way, even if it's just, hey, here's a free meal, yeah. it just feel, it makes me feel happy inside and that, I, that I'm actually doing something in the world. I, I'm in the exact same situation they've been in. So I, yeah. I, it just makes me feel happy inside that I'm able to do something. It's something I've wanted to do and I needed the challenge to be there. Yeah. And so when I, so when somebody asked me, I just jumped at the chance. To me, it, it means that we've got people in the community that aren't getting food to eat on a regular basis. So if we can get them one good meal a day or two good meals a day, that's great. It's my chance to give back to the community and uh, work with our church to help out. Um, honestly, people always say those people. Yeah. And you're so good with those people. And to me, there's no those people and us people. It's just they're all people. And I'm, I just really like people. So it's, it makes no difference to me than hanging out with my friends. Um, I mean, obviously, I feel like I'm giving back to people. Um, I feel like I'm having my heart broken every single day. I don't, you really, It really puts a face to a problem that is so often talked about in our city. And it gives you opportunity to, to share with other people that, hey, this isn't just a, a drug problem. This is like hurting people. And we can, we can do our part here. I think the most important factor for this for me is being the hands and feet of Jesus, serving people in the same way that he served people. Yeah. Um, not because um, of any uh, guilt trip or anything other than just a desire to love on people um, yeah. the same way that Jesus loves on us. I think there's a deep sense of satisfaction when you're participating with Jesus in what he is all about. And yeah. So for me, there's a deep sense of fulfillment. Yeah. Um, but I love just being part of something that is so uplifting. Uh, everyone who comes in and everyone who's here already is just here to serve and be together. Um, and so it's a really positive environment. I just want to encourage people, uh, if they've ever felt called or led to participate yeah. and serve in a way like this, I would really encourage them to do this. Uh, there's no reason to hold back. Um, this is a great opportunity to serve and partner with something that is eternally valuable. Thank you. It's wonderful to see how the Lord can use people to help people. There is that expression, hurting people hurt people. And I trust that healthy people will help hurting people as well. It's good to be here this morning. We're all tired of COVID-19. It's a nuisance, it's an inconvenience, it's a worry, it's a pain, and for some people, it's fatal. On top of that, we have all of the burdens and worries and concerns that we had before all of this happened, and they're still there and maybe even feel more difficult to deal with now than they did before. It reminded me of the Apostle Paul, who was in prison in Rome for preaching the gospel. In his second letter to Timothy, he writes, The time for my departure is near. And that was not home for a holiday. There was execution. Yet he writes of how he continues to witness and encourages Timothy to do the same. Paul's confinement was lonely and frustrating. One companion had rejected the ministry and deserted Paul. Several had left on different assignments. One person especially strongly opposed Paul's message and had a great deal of, and did a great deal of harm. Then Paul says, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. So can you imagine 
being in prison, people leaving, and nobody to help him. However, Paul closes this section with this confident conviction, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That reminds me of Ken Esau's challenge here a bit ago from Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then he said, we need glasses that don't look just at the present or just at the future, but look at both. But we have to have this long look. We're not here forever, but we have a forever. On his way to Gethsemane, where he would be arrested, Jesus assured his disciples, in the world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's John 16. We too can overcome. We can be overcomers. Jesus offered, in me you may have peace. Pastor Kimball has just spoken to us of the various members from our community who are going through difficult times, and uh, they are thankful uh, for your prayers and support and encouragement. And uh, Amy says, and remember JD, and uh, thank you so much for the meals. And so there's practical ways in which we can help as well. There are other concerns in our country and in our community and uh, in our personal lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have done so much for us. Thank you for Jesus who was willing to go this hard way so that we could have peace with you and enjoy the strength and grace and blessing that you give us. Thank you that, Lord, that you are always with us. We thank you that despite our difficulties and our frustrations and our loneliness, we can look up to you. You said your grace would be sufficient for us because your strength is made perfect in weakness. We thank you for these people who we've mentioned Thank you for the grace you're giving. Continue to encourage and would you provide and meet each of their needs. If there are other needs in our community. We ask that they could be met as well. But we also look at the good things that we have and we thank you for our pastor, for our elders. Thank you for all the work that they have done to try to keep uh, the church going and to keep connected with us. Thank you for them, and we ask that you bless them and encourage them. Give much wisdom as they seek to find direction for the future as well. We pray for Pastor Kimball, especially as he brings us the message this morning. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. Now help us all to seek your kingdom and to have peace. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, thank you, Gerhard. I always appreciate your very pastoral approach to, uh, to leading us in prayer. <clears throat> and uh, well, today we are uh, going to jump right into Article 15. Are you excited? Are you excited? Oh, look at how excited you are. Um, we are uh, continuing in our series, in our, our confession series. Uh, we have 18 articles of our confession, and we did a whole bunch of them last summer, and we're Getting to the end of them now, uh, today we we're talking about stewardship. Uh, next week, Troy uh, Kazakowicz is going to talk about the sanctity of life. And, uh, and then after that, Scott Sear will be talking about society and state, which is a pretty uh, important one right now as well. And then uh, James is going to close out the summer with uh, talking about the Lord's rest and work. And so that's kind of the next few weeks. Uh, as we come to the end, the first so all this to say with our our confession again, why do we why do we do this? Uh, it's really important to know what you believe. It's really important to know why you believe what you believe. But we also have to know how to live what we believe, and that's what our confession really is about. As we've we've said. Uh, numerous times throughout the series, that these are our lived out convictions, not, not just our statement of faith, check, 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 we believe that, yeah, 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 yeah. This is how we live this out. And so today's article on stewardship 
is one that really falls in line with that. It's, it's how, we, how we live this out. And there's some really foundational things as followers of Jesus that are, we're going to track with in this. Stewardship is a word that, you know, we don't, we don't use maybe in every common day language. This seems like sometimes you think, man, there's a lot of ships involved, isn't there, in, uh, in our faith? Discipleship and fellowship and stewardship. Those are the only three I can think of. I don't know. Maybe you're thinking of more. Uh, but what's with the ships? I don't know. But stewardships, uh, we're, we're talking about stewarding and stewarding what God has given us. And we'll, we'll flesh that out a little bit today. And hopefully you'll come away from this thinking and understanding a little bit more about what this means. Uh, <clears throat> what we could probably say in the next uh, remainder of this series is that go back and listen to Ken Esau's messages again and then uh, we'll just uh, start from there uh, because he really laid a good groundwork and giving us, as Gearhart even mentioned, uh, that, that those scriptures that lay the foundation for these articles of our faith and talking about, um, you know, the fact that these things, if, we are un, if we're not believers, if we're not part of the family of God, these things make absolutely no sense. No sense. Okay, it's kind of like those things in your family where, you know, you have the in, inside stuff and you talk or jokes or movie quotes. We have that. Everyone has that. But then, you know, someone else is coming to your table uh, for dinner and you start talking these things. And, man, you got, they have no idea what language you're talking, what you're saying. And, and that's somewhat of this is these conversations around our lived out convictions is that people could be puzzled. Like, well, what does that mean? If you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus, these things don't make much sense. Like, why would you do that? And, uh, and so this is a, a different kind of paradigm uh, that outside the family of God may not understand. And so again, Ken led us with these two framework verses, Matthew 6, 33, which says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So seeking first, that's, that's a priority. That means that Jesus, the kingdom, is the priority one. He is on the throne. Everything else is subordinate to that, and it flows out of that. Then he says, John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that you would have life and have it to the full. This, honestly, would be one of my top verses in the Bible uh, that I would say, I'd love to share this verse. I'd love to share it with you as a, as a church. love sharing it with people that we work with at camp, that this is the fullness of life. This is really living. What Jesus offers to us is the best life imaginable. It's not so many times it's, it's like you hear about religion or, or you know, things in church that just becomes a, a burden and a, and a weight and it's like obligations. Why would you do that? Put that on yourself. But, but that's not the life of Jesus. That's not what Jesus offers. He says, I've given you, I've come to give you life and a full life, a rich, full life, abundant life and eternal life. And so those things help to frame why when we look at a, an article like stewardship, okay, is, are, are we seeking first the kingdom? And how is this giving us the fullness of life, God's best life for us? So as we get into this, here's the, the opening statement of our, our confession article on stewardship, article 15. God's creation mandate. We believe the universe and everything in it belong to God the creator. God has entrusted the care of the earth to all people who are responsible for managing its resources. Good stewardship uses the earth's abundance to meet human need, but resists the unjust exploitation of the earth and its peoples. All God's gifts are to be received with thanksgiving and used responsibly. So here we have the creation mandate we find in Genesis chapter 1, and it says in verse 27 and 28 that we have this... Uh, we've been created in the image of God, in his image, and with that mandate to fill the earth, to subdue it, to rule over. Now that sounds sometimes like we have the power, we have the authority, but it's all put in the framework of being in the image of God. And so we look at how does God manage things? How does he own things? He doesn't lord it over. He doesn't seek to crush or dominate, but it's instead filled with purpose and love, with care and compassion. And then verse 28 says, God blessed them. And it wasn't just a gift, but that gift had purpose. It had a function. I'm, I'm blessing you with this, but now you have this role 
to govern. But as we know, they, they fell into sin and began to exploit rather than to govern. And so God's redemption plan from all, for all of creation in Christ is to redeem and restore what was lost. So as we get into thinking about stewardship and understanding this is God's plan, God's ordained plan for us in our role, it's going to draw on two key principles. First of all, is that God is owner of everything. God is owner of everything. Um, there's a pastor and author you might be familiar with, Greg Laurie. He tells the story of a, of a woman who had, had gone into a store, bought her groceries, came out with the bags, and was going to her car. And as she got to her car, she realized that there was, there was four men that were sitting inside her car. And so she kind of freaked out. She dropped her groceries, but she had her handbag, and out of her handbag, she pulled a handgun. And she came over to the car where these, these guys were in her car, and she says, get out of my car. I have a gun, and I know how to use it. Well, these four guys that were in the car freaked out and, and bolted. They didn't wait around for anything else. And so they got away. She picked up her groceries, put them in the car, but as she was trying to start the car, she realized that it would not start. She could not get the keys into the car. And she realized, this is not my car. And she looked down the parking lot, and there was her car. A little bit flustered, she grabbed her groceries and went over to her car. Wow, wouldn't you know it? Keys fit, started up, and she drove directly to the police station where she turned herself in. <laughs> and as she was describing this to the desk sergeant, what happened, he starts laughing and he points to the end of the counter where there are four men who are describing this and giving this account of this little old lady who had pulled a handgun on them and forced them and carjacked them out of their car. This was not her car. Apparently, she, uh, she was not charged. But here's the reality. What we have is not ours. God owns everything. If you've heard a sermon at one point on, on stewardship, on, on all this, you, you understand that. You've heard this, that God owns everything. I, I like the Toy Story movies, uh, and I, I like the, the little uh, toy that Andy has, the, you know, Woody, and on the bottom of his foot, right, it says, Andy, belonging. It says, this is his toy. Can you imagine if, if that's something that we, we would do, that we had uh, on everything that we own? God. God. He's the owner of everything. So if you misunderstand this, uh, you miss a, a lot of what your life actually is to be about. That God is the sustainer of everything. He's the creator and the sustainer. But he's not like he's distant and uninvolved. That he just, he just started at things off and gave us things and said, okay, go have fun and I'll, I'll see you at the end. He's intimately involved and he is working powerfully in our world. He's changing lives by his spirit. And he invites us to, to participate in this. See, how tragic we would be, it would be if we missed this and we got to the end of our life. And just a reminder, we don't know when that will be. But if we lived a long and full life, but we, we looked back and we, we said, man, we just assumed ownership of everything. And in that, we missed out on God's ultimate purpose for our life. God owns everything. The second principle is that God has entrusted significant things to us. He's entrusted things to us. If you went to a, a nice hotel, I don't know about you, if you, you kind of go to nice hotels where someone will meet you or, you know, a steward or someone at the, at the door and says, uh, I, I will take your bags up to, you know, your, your, your room, right? Um, I, I don't usually go to hotels like that or whatever, you know, Motel 6 or whatever. It's like, there's a room up the stairs. But if you went to a nice hotel and someone was there and they said, I will take your bags up to your room for you. And they were this, this steward. They were entrusted. You would give them your bags. 
But if that steward would just say, you know what, I like this. These bags are pretty nice. I bet there's some really cool stuff inside. And they took it to their room and they opened it up and they said, whoa, nice iPad. And they just assumed ownership. Well, you would probably notice and they would probably be fired. They weren't being a good steward because a steward doesn't assume ownership. A steward is trusted and is to care and to manage. Often when you, you hear a message on stewardship, you're thinking, okay, great, another message on, on giving to the church. But, you know, that's just one small part of stewardship. God has entrusted so much more. So here's a few things of what has God entrusted to us. First of all, he's entrusted us with his earth. It's his earth. All the resources, all the environment, everything that we have in our earth, it's from him. And he's entrusted it to us. Our daughter, Jessa, right now, she's in the middle of her third, kind of fourth year of, of environmental studies. Uh, and uh, I don't exactly know what that's going to mean. But, um, you know, as a dad, I'm like, okay, I don't know, environmental geography. But she's doing some cool stuff. And this summer, she has a job where she is um, analyzing or recording mosquito habitats in the lower mainland. Now, I don't know exactly if she's encouraging them to breed, because I would not be in favor of that. But she's doing something as far as watching, you know, watching as far as their patterns and everything like that. And, uh, but she's always cared about the environment. And I remember when she was about 10 years old, and I think grade 5, and she came home, and she had, they'd been learning about recycling and repurposing. And so she said, Dad, we have to start composting. And I said, no, we don't. <laughs> that smells bad. She says, yes, we have to start composting. We have to recycle. We have to save the earth. It's very important that we do our part. And my response was, well, could we start by just having you turn off the lights when you're in the house <laughs> or going out of the house? Like start, you know, just do the part. But we all have moments of hypocrisy, right, in this. Uh, when we think about the environment, what is our, our footprint? But the care of the earth uh, to humanity. We've been given dominion, but that's with responsibility. Every Christian can and should do more to help the environment reduce our footprint. It's a gift from God. He's entrusted us with his gifts. Ever stop and think of all the gifts that God has given to you. Sometimes we just overall just neglect them. Um, but some of them are very important. What about life itself? Today you woke up, didn't think about it, but you took in air. He gave you air in your lungs to breathe. Uh, some of you have gone through hard times and, and there's been moments where I'm sure even thinking about JD and Ryan, right? You've, you've gone through moments where it's like, what what is this? But God has given you a gift of this day. Each of us, we woke up and trusted us with life, with breath. He's given us time. Like I said, we don't know how much we're given. 1,440 minutes today, you, you will potentially receive that. You don't know how much of that you will live. It's a precious quantity. You can't go back and, and retrieve yesterday's. Um, you know, Russ and I, we're 50 now, right? We can't, we can't go back, Russ. Can't do it. Can't retrieve moments of days gone by. But our best years, right, are still ahead of us, we hope. But this, this time is, is a gift from God. We've given, he's given us a body. At first when I wrote this, I said he's given us your body. But it goes against what the verse that I'm going to read says, 1 Corinthians 6.20. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. It is a gift. It is your body. But sometimes we hold that very tightly and we say, this is my body and I'm going to do whatever I want with it. But it's a gift from God. We've been given abilities and spiritual gifts. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Within our body, there are those who have very 
unique and amazing abilities that are nurses. Some of those, they're not able to be here with us right now. We have nurses. We have doctors. We have teachers. We have those who are good with accounting. We have those who, who are good at public speaking. We have those who have nurturing abilities as in their, in their roles in, in schools and at home. We have those who are good at sports, music, art. Some, some of you, just like everything that you, you put your mind to just turns to money. Like it's just like you have the ability and it just grows. Those are, those are abilities. Those are gifts from God. God has also given us, to some degree, you might say, well, where's my wealth? But wealth in, in different terms, but understanding there's things that you've been given, wealth and possessions from God. When we first bought our home, I maybe have shared this story before, but it, it always comes to my mind when I think of stewardship, because when we first bought our home in Abbotsford, um, I was just about 40 years old. We hadn't been able to save up money to buy a house in B.C., but then we were able to, in our move to Abbotsford, to buy this house. And, and the words of Deuteronomy chapter 8 just kept resonating in my mind. Because it's the words where, where God says to the people, I'm giving you the land. You're going to move into the, the land, the land of promise. But when you do that, do not forget me. Because the tendency will be for you to build nice houses, to plant your vineyards, to have your herds grow and wealth will be accumulated. But in that, you will say, look what I have done. And you will forget the Lord. And so as I looked at our house, and, and it's been a, a process of thinking all the things that we have in our life, things that we've been given, that it is from the hand of God. It is not of us. And that's where God continues in that passage is to say, I've given you the ability to do everything that you can to gain wealth. All that you have is from me, has been entrusted to me, to us. So what do we do with this? What's our heart response? See, that has to, has to be the case. We can't just say, oh, it's our religious duty or understanding this is from God and stewardship, okay, as a Christian follower of Jesus, I gotta obey Article 15. Probably said no one ever <clears throat> until today. But there's a heart response. There has to be something that God stirs in your heart uh, for this to happen. And so what's the first response? It needs to be contentment. Contentment. This is what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy, that godliness with contentment is great gain. See, there's a difference. We want to be satisfied. We look for satisfaction. When we, we go to a restaurant... Right? We, we, or we have coffee somewhere, and, and if there's an opportunity for a you know, Yelp review, we rate our satisfaction level. Were you served well? Did, was the food good? Everything we look and we say, was I satisfied? But that's different than contentment. See, satisfied, being satisfied is when, when your, your desires have been met. But that's not the case, and that's not what God calls us to. Because that's not going to always be the case that our desires are going to be met in this life. But instead, we're called to be content. And content is living joyfully when our desires have not been met. So even looking at the gifts and abilities that God has given us for us to accomplish our purpose, not, not ourselves, not just your stuff, but the, the other gifts that he's given you. What are you doing with that? And do you recognize that you have contentment in that? See, sometimes I hear a good communicator and I think, man, if only I could articulate things and theological arguments and, and perspectives on the Bible like Ken Esau, amen? Or I think, if only I had a cool Kiwi accent like Callum, you know? Let alone those arms, right? But I won't get into that again. I've gone there before. That would be golden, <laughs> it's a Calamism. Or another pastor, another speaker, you know, we listen to things and we think, well, if only I had those gifts or those abilities, but this is what I got to work with. <laughs> now, that's not to be an excuse. 
Because sometimes we look at ourselves and we say, well, this is what I got. That's it. Take it or leave it. But God's given us also a motivation in us to, to improve, to grow. We nurture our spiritual gifts. The natural abilities that we have take work, take practice, take effort. We don't just get apathetic and say, well, this is all I got and that's all I'm going to do. And hopefully that's good enough for God. We can grow. We can develop skills. We don't have to be lazy about it. God has equipped us, though, for a purpose, and it's not for someone else's. I want to say this as far as on the side of contentment. If you feel that you're trapped, if you feel that there's, your mind is drawn towards things about money all the time, and I know we're in a tough situation right now where you're looking at, at things maybe leaving your bank account quicker than coming in, or you don't know exactly where you know, your, your paycheck is, is going to come from in the next while. But sometimes there's, there's a root that forms in our li- life, and that the Bible talks about that as greed. And throughout the New Testament, that, that root, as it grows, forms what's called idolatry. So when, when money and stuff and things, and we look around, we're not content, but we just want more. And we're going to do whatever we can to get it. That greed takes root and that forms idolatry. And idolatry is just whatever is sitting on the throne. It's not Jesus. So if that's you today, I, I invite you, I, I plead with you to repent. To ask God to start changing your heart. To stir in your heart affections for him. That you'd pray that God would you make me content. It might be a process. It's not going to be an in, you know, instantaneous thing. But start patterning your thoughts and your actions towards things that will move you towards a contented life. The second heart response is generosity. So we have something now that we can actually do and act out of it. I love the, the passage in, in Exodus where... Uh, Moses, it says, you know, I'll read this. They were, they were form, coming together to build the tabernacle. God says, build me a, a tabernacle, a place of meeting, uh, that I will be with you. And he gave them very specific details. And so they were forming, you know, this is what they were doing. And so then Moses summoned Bezalel and Ohol- Oholiab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given Ability and who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, The people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more, because what they had already had was more than enough to do all the work. Can you, I mean, I don't know if you get the picture of this. This is like, okay, this is the stuff we need, people, and they just kept bringing it. And I was like, great, that was great. Next day, oh, they're bringing more. Okay, uh, where are we going to put all this? Bringing more the next day. That they had to say, stop. No more. No more more gifts. No more giving to the Lord. (laughs) Can you imagine? It would be like Dale of our, you know, finance getting up here. You know, I don't want to do my best Dale imitation. But but he looks like Moses. He could be, right? He might have done a Moses get at church sometime? No? Okay. Anyways, but he gets up here and he would say, you know, College Drive, you've been so generous. Just stop. Like, we have so much, we just don't know what to do with it all. <laughs> yeah, right? That's, that's what happened when God stirred the hearts of the people from contentment, what God was providing for them, to, to generosity. Can you imagine? And we as elders, we fully recognize how many of you have stepped up in these days and have been generous and we're grateful. Are you generous? So what should guide us in our our priorities? I guess I had that one. What should guide our priorities in our generosity? Two things that I want to suggest to you. 
there's lots of great causes. You're probably like us, there's, there's invitations, there's need in the world, it's so great. Um, many of you like, like us have been affected in our family by cancer. We need cancer research, research takes money. We've also been affected in our, with our friends on, in uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, I mean, terrible, terrible disease. Need research, research costs money. And so I don't want you to hear me say that all like things of this, this earth and the things that we need, um, you know, that you should not contribute to out of generosity. But I want to just prompt you with this, is that as followers of Jesus, what are the top priorities? Right? That's where we, that's where we set the bar because we say we are, we're followers of Jesus, that we are, we're members of a different kingdom. So that's where we have to focus. And so... Priorities that should guide us is, is kingdom mission. Kingdom mission. This needs to be at the forefront. And so whether that is, that is the church, that is mission, that is camps, that is organizations that are actively involved in the mission of the gospel. That's, that's what should prioritize when you look at where, am I, where should I be generous? Look at where is the kingdom of God advancing? How could I be a part of that? And secondly, is care for and concern for the poor. This was always at the heart of the church, the apostles' teachings. James says, if a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food, if you say, go in peace, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but you do nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Faith needs to act. And the poor is not just those without basic needs. The poor are those who are treated unjustly, those who are abandoned, marginalized, disadvantaged. So I, I encourage you to think about, okay, is the things in my resources that I am stewarding from God, is it going to something that is helping the poor? As we close, just the, the final gift that we'll talk about today is just the gospel. He's entrusted us with the gospel. Specifically to us, to the church. Good news of Jesus. And man, we need to be articulating the gospel and living the gospel in a way uh, that he would say, you are worthy of the gospel. He's entrusted us with these things. So I want to ask you today, how are you and I doing as stewards? There's an end audit and what we do matter, and we're accountable for it. This is Second Corinthians, first of all, 5, verse 9 to 10 says, So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. We're accountable. He's given us gifts. He's the owner of all, but he says... He will hold you accountable. You will come face to face with Jesus. It's not a judgment of salvation. We are in Christ, secure in, in Christ in our faith. But what we have done with what he has given, we will be accountable for. The application of this message is, is personal, so you have to take some stock. Do I believe and, and live this? Is this core conviction true of me that God is the owner of everything that I have? What am I doing with the gifts that he has entrusted me with? Ask yourself, am I content with what I have? Am I living generously? And if I have truly received the gospel, am I stewarding well the gospel? We've received it, not just for us ourselves. Let's pray. God, thank you that you've given us purpose. You've given us a mission, and you have equipped us, and you've entrusted us with things to help us to accomplish that. Thank you that you are redeeming all things, restoring all of creation to yourself, and that you're choosing to allow us to participate with you in that. Uh, we each of us have moments where we're selfish, where we, we think about our bank account, we think about the things that we can do. 
what we want to do for ourselves. Pray you would stir in our hearts an affection for you that would move us beyond ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for joining us today at College Drive. We're going to sing another song in just a few minutes. If you want to stick around, if you need to go, just maybe wait till the ushers, how they uh, escort you out. I um, just want to say a special, um, I guess, uh, greeting to uh, this crew here, um, sitting by my wife. Uh, this is our cohort from SABC. This is our last week at camp, and so it's been great for them to be able to come and to, to worship with us when they've been able to on the weekend. But um, just a very gifted group of young people. Um, and God has been faithful and uh, drawn them together, used them for, for his mission. They have stewarded their summer uh, very well. So it's been great having you guys here with us. I uh, just want to close. Yeah. This is the beautiful benediction from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. May God bless you this week.